food except maybe a high quality level of comfort food. <laughs> um, I also sitting there is Jesse Marsh Tarzan, the the big thick dark horse collection of that Tarzan material, which is on uncoated paper stock. It's one of those really nice archival uh, reprints. I, I don't know about archival editions, but it's one of those really nice reprints where like the paper stock and everything flatters the original work. Um, you know, Jesse Marsh, uh, contemporary of Alex Toth, at least at like Western and Dell. And we would always hear about him from people like Dylan Williams to the Hernandez brothers in that um, in the studio book that comic art had put out. So it's nice to sit down with those. They're a very pretty comic to look at. And then the other thing that I have a bookmark in the middle of is Rusty Brown, which hopefully you and I, I think, are both reading that right now. Um, you know, it's a reread for a lot of that material that was originally published in Acme Novelty Library. But it has been really fun going through that book again. So I hope we might do a book club on that one at some point in the future. How far are you into Rusty Brown? I got I got two chapters so far. I think I might be three. I, I just finished up the uh, Seeing Eye Dogs of Mars chapter. Yeah, that's three. And uh, man, that's a story. <laughs> I was I'm preparing myself for that one, man. <laughs> <laughs> I I actually recommended that to a student uh, in in my finals meetings. But with the caveat of like, this is a very, very sad story. So <laughs> be prepared for that. One. Yeah, go get the sad lamps, man. Those vitamin D gimmicks. But that's how Absolutely. It, to me, like Chris Ware is like summertime reading, man. Like you want a lot of sunlight. You want a lot of vitamin D. You want to get out <laughs> of the house. You want to you want to move your, your bones a little bit because he's going to he's going to get you, man. He's going to get you with that uh, with that sad sadness and all that. It's heavy stuff, but you know what surprised me on rereading it is because I always think that way too, you know, that it's, it, it is heavy material. Read it in the summertime, as you say, Ed. I think that's one of the funniest things I've heard you say about, about any comic. Yeah. Uh, also very accurate. But uh, the first couple of chapters, there are some harsh moments in them, but also they are like really great stories and characterization. And, you know, like it's, it's Rusty Brown as a kid for anybody that hasn't read this. So you're seeing him in school. There are just some like incredible moments. If you think of stuff like freaks and geeks that have interesting, you know, interesting moments in that setting, Rusty Brown has some incredible stuff in those first couple chapters. Yeah. Agreed, man. I've been reading stuff all over the place. Uh, put a dent in a few more Tanko Bowen volumes of Fist of the North Star which I could easily recommend. Yeah, uh, that's and I am revisiting Preacher comics, man. Interesting. Um, I, it was my favorite series when it was coming out. It was the, the last monthly series that I read. I started reading it um, with issue number 22 or 23. Uh, the book, the series came out right after I got burnt on all of those you know, image number ones and all that. And so I, I gave it a good two years to find some footing and to like let people let let word of mouth keep building uh, because I didn't want to get burned anymore. That's sort of like what I do at television shows. Like I watched Sopranos like three years ago because I needed a decade's worth of time to transpire uh, before I gave it a shot because it's a big time commitment and uh, and I don't want to waste it. That's why I never fuck with Lost. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I I, re I read the first two trades over and over again because I always would get this idea in mind of like, I'm going to reread the whole series. And uh, that is basically what I read so far. I read about the first 23, 24 issues. But when I started picking it up in monthly fashion, I read those basically once, you know? 25 years ago or however long it's been. So it's something that stuck with me and I want that spirit. I want, I want my uh, red room comic to em embody a little bit of that spirit of gallows humor. Um, but you know, like to me, it's, it's a great comic. In fact, I would say that the collaborative team early on of Ennis and Dylan with Matt Hollingsworth uh, colorist and I believe it's Clen Robbins uh, lettering to me that is one of the great comic book collaborative teams um, they're all firing on all cylinders Matt Matt H who kind of came into prominence with the Hawkeye series uh, with his colors over top of David Aha, he was good way back then 
he was in the game way back then, which I didn't realize until I, I reread this thing. But he might be one of the early guys using using um using computer coloring that actually applied some color theory rather than just technical prowess of being able to like use a computer. Um, so definitely really cool. And I have a lot to say about Preacher, man. But but um, you know, we we I could bring that up in a little bit. Have you ever read that series? I have read that series. Uh, hearing you talk about it now makes me think I should be reading it again. Like that would be a fun book club. That was a series that I read. Somebody must have handed me volume one or something because I was probably, I don't know, maybe it was up to issue 50 or so when I started reading it. And I just got to blow through like the first seven or eight trades of it. And then I read up to where they had trades and then I bought all the monthly issues, which, you know, it was six or eight issues ahead, read all of those and then read it monthly through the end of the series. And my enthusiasm dampened in that last six months or so. And I think it was because reading it one month and then waiting a month and waiting a month just wasn't the best way to read that series, I don't think. Uh, at least it wasn't after I was coming off the charge of like, I've read the first 50 issues in a week. <laughs> now what do I do? Um I would be curious to revisit it. And your comment about about uh, the colorist, you know, being a strong colorist, it's interesting because that was a series that it didn't make sense to me when I would just see like a panel or maybe an interview or something in Wizard where it was like, that doesn't, it doesn't look that great. Like, I don't understand it. And then upon reading it, it's like, I'm in, it all works, you know, became a fan of Dylan's, like everything made sense once I started reading it. And I think all those parts did add up. You know, you say it's a great creative team. I think that's very, very true. And it does make me want to revisit it now, um, you know, geez, like 20 years later at this point or something. Um, it would be interesting to revisit it and talk about it. I'm having a ball with it. And it is going to be fun to, to kind of read it all at once as, as a unit. Uh, I have so many takeaways, man. Uh, one is that the comedic timing and the pacing is second to none in this series. It made me think about in earlier wizard episodes that we did with about uh, Peter Bag. I mentioned that Peter Bag is one of the very few cartoonists who was able to get me to kind of like laugh out loud. And when I reread these preacher comics, I realized that preacher might be the only other comic where I legitimately belly laugh or laugh out loud. And it has to do with Ennis's contribution as well as, I mean, Dylan's contribution as much as, as Ennis's. Sometimes it's, it's pacing issues of just, it could be a silent sequence and a funny moment happens. Um, sometimes it's, it is a visual piece, but it's so rare to me in comics to get that kind of belly laugh. Uh, usually what I would call humor is something that would make me it would like strike a resonant chord of like of like oh uh-huh yeah that's funny but i never like laugh you know right so that was one of the beauties of that comic that these guys were able to weave a couple of pages together here and there man to like really lighten the tension and, and fucking crack me up um another um, you know what, yeah. Ed, to inter interrupt, to just add a little bit to that, Dude. last week we were talking about writing and, and good dialogue in comics. Preacher is probably one of those examples of really strong dialogue in a comic. Um, my memory of Preacher and what I loved were the characters and characterization. And, you know, Steve Dillon's, like, so much of it was faces that he was drawing. You know, great reference for expressive face faces. But I think like that has to be one of the great dialogue books. The fact that it's making you laugh out loud. You know, my response was caring about those characters. And whenever they would do something shitty to each other, man, it would really, you know, like it felt real. It was like that moment of like, I, I, I hate I hate that, you know, Cassidy did this or whatever. Um, so that, that may be one of those examples of really strong dialogue in a comic. Jim, I'm so freaking glad you you brought that up, actually, because that was the impetus for me rereading this uh, for a certain extent. Like when we were talking during that last Kayfabe Weekly about dialogue and shit, that came to mind during the conversation. But I wanted to revisit it just to see <laughs> if uh, if it is was the way that I remembered. Um, another reason I'm kind of giving this a shot, too, is that I discovered there is, you know, instead of doing like preacher annual 
they would do an, a one shot or a mini series. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had them all. You know, there's a Saint of Killers, there's the Arse Face, there's a <laughs> Cassidy one, and uh, there's a Star one. And then I realized that there is a one shot that was done by Ennis and Dylan. So it's like I just made, I just found a diamond in the rough. Something that like it's it's like when Tribe Called Quest put a new album out a year or two ago after Fife Dog died. Like you just never thought you would get anything fresh, you know. So I have this fresh one shot at the end of the tunnel that I'm going to read after I finish the whole series. Um, keeping up with my thoughts on uh, on Preacher a little bit. And one of the things I would implore you to make note of when you crack those those books open again is Steve Dillon's art is almost like Dan DiCarlo Archie in a way. It, it, now, obviously, there's more line work, but <laughs> but Steve Dillon has these like rubber stamped faces and a lot of it is dialogue driven. And you see, like, he draws these same perfect faces over and over again, the side view, the three quarter view, all of that. But his attention to detail when it comes to background, he gives you just enough, you know, like it is a very simple backgrounds and it is not to the detriment of the work at all. I was, uh, after reading a gang of, of, uh, these issues, I went on to comic art fans and was looking at some original pages, uh, you know, in uh, heritage auctions and stuff. And that's when it like clicked. I'm like, wow, this really is like Archie backgrounds and, you know, these rubber stamped Dan DiCarlo, like perfect fucking characters. Uh, it's great storytelling, man, you know, because he, he really gives you just enough and he knows it's a color book. So he's leaving lots of room. Uh, to his color collaborators, man. Yeah, that's a, it, it's a good point. It, one thing that stood out to me with Preacher back in the day is that it was one creative team, you know, throughout that run, which was stark contrast to say something like Invisibles or Sandman, you know, the other Vertigo books that I would think of, especially with longer runs. And, you know, some of it is figuring out, like, I don't know how long it took him to draw an issue, but I bet you he could turn one around quickly if need be. Uh, you know, if, if for whatever reason a script was delayed or, or changes were made, you know, from an editorial standpoint or whatever, um, you know, lots of reasons why you don't get a full month to draw a monthly book. <laughs> and I'm sure that he faced that a few times. Um, you know, I mean, that's it's part of figuring out how to make a good comic, especially given the parameter of it's a monthly schedule. It's much better than, you know, how much would you be bummed out if every seventh issue was drawn by someone else, you know, or the middle of a story arc or whatever, like part of those characters was that 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 Steve Dillon interpretation of them and it wouldn't be the same without him you know the the one shots and specials notwithstanding if you're doing it on its own you can kind of frame that a certain way but for a monthly book like it was it was critical to its to my reaction to that book that he was there every month very noteworthy that he never sort of missed an issue uh, that thing came out reliably like the third week of every month. And I was, I was there for each and uh, every one of those. Uh, the one other thing that I sort of took away from the series so far in broad strokes is that Ennis had a big plan in mind from, from early on. Um, I do not get the impression that it was like the Neil Gaiman th throw things up at the wall, uh, you know, throw softballs up and then so that you have something to catch later. Uh, there's a complexity to that story that um, just would require lots and lots of issues to unravel. And I kind of like that, that they kind of went for it early on. Uh, what I mean is uh, I guess around that time, like the common, the common wisdom would be to give a, a comic it's it's 12 issue you know one year run and then go from there um things that were talked about in the earliest issues really didn't get explored until like issue 25 and as you unpack each and every one of these little pieces it just makes the story more rich and i have to imagine that some of these 
critical pieces were there at the beginning. I guess, Jim, what I'm saying is, K Fabers, get me in touch with freaking Garth Ennis because we need to have him uh, on the stream. We need to do a shoot interview with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good. That's a good call, Ed. I, I'm sure he would be a fascinating guy to get on here. Um, speaking of which, we we should plug that we had Ben Mara on. Uh, you know, one of the first guests that we've had a chance to bring on in this format and talk to um, just happened the other night. And Ben's a delight. We've known Ben for a while. So he certainly didn't disappoint. I, I had no doubt. And the response we're getting to that has certainly indicated that's the case. If anybody's watching and they're not familiar with Ben Mara, I would say definitely give that interview a, a chance. Um, you described him, Ed, as a modern outlaw legend yeah. <laughs> and a perfect description for, for the guy and for his comics. Yeah, I was I was shocked that he that he never uh, thought of, of himself in those lights, man, because that really is the exact thing that brought me to his work was was the fact that it was like, wow, I, I never thought that anybody else looked at Carnage from Eternity Comics except me. <laughs> 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 it's hilarious to think of the uh, Carnage fan club, and I, and I don't mean Spider Man's uh, enemy. No, no, we're talking about that super verbose black and white comic that I defy anybody to uh, actually read. Yeah, that's not an easy read. But uh, you know, when when we talk to Ben, I mean, like outlaw is a relatively new term in ter in 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 terms of comics, and it's interesting on a show like Cartoonist Kayfabe to use the term outlaw whenever in wrestling terms it is definitely not a compliment for you know as Cornette always says an outlaw mud show yeah um, i think we, we we that's at least one place we differ greatly from the wrestling world in, in terminology so you know hey we addressed it right away with ben too talking about how he viewed his comics and described them you know maybe before outlaw became a term that, that sums it up well and on, on sunday we released our kevin eastman interview piece man with uh gary groth from comics journal issue 202 man to a tremendous fanfare a lot of people were waiting for us to talk about that shit including me <laughs> <laughs> we've been talking about it for a while i think we've been talking about it for six months ever since the wizard coverage of uh of whenever tundra was sold to kitchen sink press um i think we have both read that interview years ago it's amazing like like the response to, to us posting and talking about it has been really great and seeing everybody else's comments. I've gotten emails uh, from people who worked at Tundra and, and were associated around that time period that have been enlightening as well. Um, but I do think that's a tremendous interview. I think there's a lot of transparency and honesty in that interview. And the story of Tundra, I am absolutely delighted by the story of Tundra and that interview really dissects it, you know, the whole timeline of that publishing company. You had a week to think about it, man. Is there, is there anything that uh, you left on the table? Uh, you didn't get a chance to express w from the uh, Eastman interview. I do have a takeaway, Ed, and it, and it's more than just the Eastman interview. And it's this Eastman is a comics lifer, you know, like he's still out making comics, continued making comics, you know, post Tundra, post turtles, more turtles, that gives me a lot of, uh, you know, I guess I'm an Eastman fan. How about that? <laughs> you know, um, it's exciting that he put his money where his mouth was. And so did Peter Laird. Like, I think about the influence of what those two guys have had on comics from Tundra to the Zurich Foundation grants. And it's incredible, man. They really did a lot for comics. Obviously, the influence of self-publishing in the Turtles, but also sticking around, you know, in, in ways outside of the Turtles that I think led to, certainly with the Zeric Foundation, a lot of cartoonists getting a spotlight early on. And Tundra is just, it's this fantasy come to life. Like, there aren't that many examples in, in media, in any media, of what Tundra was. You know, it was a daydream by a guy who had enough money and resources to make it a reality, but it was a fantasy. Like, you know sometimes fantasies are better off as fantasies. And I think Tundra is probably one of those, but as an industry, I think we benefit from having a Tundra in our past that we can look at and study and, and kind of think about. You think about any other uh, comics journal interviews that, that we should uh, take a look at and unpack. I, I have a, I have a few in mind. 
Um, you know, there are a lot of good ones, and it, it really depends what direction we want to go. Like, the Comics Journal has been such a historically great record for comics. I was looking at one recently. Whenever I dug out the Eastman interview, I came across the Fort Thunder issue, which has a surgeon interview with Batman and, like, a big overview of Fort Thunder, which I love. Um, you know, that's much more of a niche thing than something like Tundra and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and it's not particularly controversial. But just for information, like it's an amazing, amazing document, uh, especially as Fort Thunder becomes, I think, more and more, I don't know, lost to history, you know, as those guys kind of go their own direction. Um, but I have a lot of like old issues. I have the Neil Gaiman interview with the Hernandez brothers. I wonder, like, that's spectacular. I, yeah, I've never read that. And I, and I would love to love to cover that one in a big way for sure. Um, There's a fun one with uh, spouses of cartoonists. It's pretty wild. And it's like, I think it's it's Dan Klaus, Chris Ware, uh, Beto. And I can't remember the, maybe Adrian Tomini. I, I'm guessing at the fourth one. I can't remember the fourth person. But it's all of their like wives and girlfriends. I think it was from like a CBLDF cruise or something where they all happen to be trapped, I guess. But it's a pretty wild interview to hear like their wives tell tell a few stories about those guys. <laughs> Uh, Gary did an interview with Jack Kirby that I think would be very valuable uh, to to kind of go through. Uh, it's it's a it's a warts and all approach in the same way as the Kevin Eastman in a way. Um, uh, Jack Kirby does not come off as infallible in in that piece, and uh, it makes him very human. You know, there's a lot of idolaters in uh, the, the the fan community uh if they're told that this person's great that person's great and they just automatically assume that everything that that person does i mean that, to me that's the definition of a fanboy uh if you don't have a least favorite work of this creator or that creator then it's almost like it's, it's all null and void your entire f- thought process regarding this person is null and void and uh one of the the craziest things in that uh interview is when when kirby says that he uh he created Spider-Man. Uh, and that's the one that everybody, that's what everybody remembers. Like, what? What are you talking about? Um, that one would be good. I picked up. I've never read that Kirby interview. I'd be, I'd be very interested to read that one. Ah, uh, dude, I, I, I committed a few pieces to memory, man. So like, uh, I will be paraphrasing when I say this, but there's this one part where he's ta- where Gary's talking to him and Kirby says, you could just picture, you imagine the Kirby crackle above his head when he says it. Uh, and he says something like, now, I, I'm not going to say that a guy can lift a building over his head, but, <laughs> but if that building came down on his toe, he might be able to lift it a few inches and just like <laughs> shit like that. Like there, there's so many moments of like that where it's just like this magical thinking that would be really fun to, uh, to dissect and, and talk about. Um, one other issue that I actually thought I would never get my hands on physically, but I did. Uh, and I got it from Cal Johnston when we were up there at Strange Adventures in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia this past uh, summer is the Harlan Ellison issue of, of TCJ. The one with the big Harlan Ellison interview that um, that sort of got got Fantagraphics in a little bit of hot water. Um, most of these things we have, though, are, are digital and uh, Fanta gave us the, 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 the keys to the kingdom when it came to. Uh, the comics journal. So we can literally talk about any issue we want to. Uh, and just the format it would take though, the visuals would be a little bit different than what we've uh, done in the past. If we don't have the physical copy. Two other favorites of mine is the uh, top 100 list issue. That's a pretty fun one. And I'm not sure how we would go through that maybe 10 or 20 at a time. Uh, Because that would be a fun one to actually pull examples of the comics they're talking about, you know, and show off some of the high points and low points. That was another Spurgeon, uh, you know, like he helmed that top 100 list, which lots of people contributed to. And then the I think it's issue 200 is like a flip issue. One side is Chris Ware and one one side is Charles Schultz. And man, that thing is just a masterpiece. The the one other one that uh, jumps to mind, too, uh, that would be worth talking about would be the uh the bill the bill watterson uh interview for, it's from the 80s it might be from 86 um yeah it's it's i'm quite sure it's from the 80s but a bill watterson interview is a rare morsel 
And I just read a few pages of it whenever a kayfaber was making suggestions about uh, things that we should check out. And it's this guy, this guy uh, lives by his word, man. Like he sort of stuck to his guns uh, the entire time with everything that he said and talked about, man. So uh, that that would be a valuable one, I think, for us to, uh, to, to, to talk about, man. But there are so many. There are so many, man. We're, we're coming up into year two. A lot of plans. Yeah, Watterson would be awesome. That would be fun. Like we haven't talked a lot about, uh, you know, comic strips. That would be that would be very. I'd be up for that. Comic strips are one of these things. Like, I feel like everybody's got to try it once. Um, you know, like right behind me, you see this this bookshelf full of books that are done by say half dozen to maybe ten ten different guys all using four panels, four squares to, to get different points across. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating economic amount of squares and there's infinite amounts of possibilities. Um, when I've been sitting around doing work on a uh, red room, I've been writing ideas because I have like the perfect idea for like four panel thing. Um, but I just want to accumulate a lot of ideas and I want to get them done kind of in secret so that I could just like blast them on, on the Instagram. But, uh, on top of what I'm already doing, I, uh, the gears are grinding dude to do like a daily strip format comic. I don't want to call it a story, but it, it kind of is, um, worth trying for sure. And Bill Watterson in, in, in our age, our day and age, he was a top dog. I, I love that format, Ed, what you say about it, you know, in addition to being um, using the same format every day, because in a way we do that with pages, you know, I think guys do that with pages to some extent, but doing the four panels per day is also, you're thinking that's that those characters all the time for years, you know, especially several volumes of, of uh, collection. It's, you know, maybe decades of just like thinking about a relatively simple formula and how to how to present that in a variety of ways. Um, it's pretty great. You know, like whenever uh, whenever I started working with color or when students want to start working with color, I often suggest a limited palette because it's it's less moving parts. You know, it's a little bit easier to manage. And when you think of a comic strip, it has that quality of like, here's the format. This is what, you know, you have to work with. But man, like those parameters are where all creativity comes from. In the past uh, couple of weeks, as I've been just reading more and more and more, um, I think the sort of rule of thumb for myself going forward, and this is what I, how I basically rocked it my entire young life, but by reading, you know, Chris Ware, freaking Fist of the North Star comics, Preacher comics, and varying things up a lot, uh, it keeps like this unorthodox mindset when it comes to the comic page where so much is possible. And when you're in a creative mode uh, and you're grinding and you're hustling and you're making something, it, it, it keeps fresh in my mind all the various tools at my disposal to get the story across. And it's been it's been insanely in inspiring the past couple of weeks so much so that everything I said about being a day walker last week, that is null and void now because <laughs> I just got caught up and fucking so excited. And I forgot what usually happens when I really start start grinding on my comics and get get stoked. Uh, I lay in that bed and I lay there for you know 10 minutes and I'm like, you know, I really want to see what that page will look like when it's done. And I walk my happy ass, you know, 15 feet over that way and just get back to work. So, so that's sort of like where I've been at with that, man. And I, and I think a big part of it is, um, just reading a lot more. Um, and, and by, by being able to carve the time to do that, I was able to, um, well, let me, let me put it this way. The way that I was able to to buy this extra time for myself, dude. Uh, Cause you know how it goes, man. Once you hit a certain age, you gotta be your own parent. Uh, and I put 
I put uh, on the new iPhone, I didn't know that there was this ability to put a limit on uh, on screen usage. Uh, so it's it's in the settings. <laughs> it's it's in the settings. And uh, I put this, an is, out- this is your cartooning uh, cartoonist tip for the week. It really is, man. Uh, I put an hour limit on the thing. And it served me well, uh, like knowing that it's like there's an hour. OK, boom, you hit your social medias whenever you have a fresh drawing. Um, maybe you check it out a little bit later. But, dude, just an hour. I have no idea what kind of time I spent on it before, but it would be a constant series of all day, just like looking uh, in between, you know, letting the ink dry or something like that. Fuck that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to strip everything down to the way that it was before I had a phone, basically, like when I just like had I was able to read so much more, draw so much more. What is the difference from between then and now? Just a stupid fucking phone and access to people, you know, like I'm, I'm taking it old school, man. Uh, I might not see your text right away, you know, that kind of thing. I might not be able to respond to your email right away. And, and I uh, I ran out after our last Kayfabe Weekly, and I uh, immediately bought a uh, little alarm clock uh, for the bedroom so that I don't even have the phone in that bedroom, dude. It's been great, man. It's increased productivity, I'd say 30%. I make all of my students track their time. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you know, it was something I did, I don't know, 10 years ago. I, I did this over a series of a month or two. And the stuff that would emerge, like whenever I did it, is exactly what you're describing. It was how much time was wasted between switching tasks, because that's when it'd be like, oh, okay, I'm putting this away. I'll check my email. I'll do this. I'll go on Instagram. And once I was tracking it, you realize like, man, I spent like, you know, two and a half hours today virtually doing nothing. It would be 20 minutes between this and that. 30 minutes, it was very easy to waste 20 to 30 minutes just switching tasks. And you realize like, that's it. Like all morning, I'm going to draw this one thing instead of multitasking and bouncing around. It's just invisible. You know, it's just this waste that you don't realize how much is there until you kind of like find a way to to measure it or to keep an eye on it. So yeah, I mean, this is <laughs> what you're describing is constant, you know, of like make adjustments, find a way to do this better, find a way to get rid of the stuff that has no value at all. Where, where are you at, man? You, you gave me some solid advice last week. And uh, I've been in during the tenure of us kicking it. You gave me a lot of good gems, man. So so uh, how do you kind of uh, progress throughout your work day? And how do you like what kind of stuff do you cut out? Like what kind of routine did you put yourself in? Is it something that you could quantify easy? Uh, not really. I mean, it's mostly just ganging what I'm doing. Um, you know, and this was a year ago. But I, I, I have certain tasks that I do every day from you know checking emails and stuff, and I just do all this stuff in the morning. It's like all coffee pre breakfast kind of business, and then it's like all day draw, and. That's mostly it, with some exceptions of things like meetings and whatever. Um, so you check it email one time per day? I check it more than once. I'll check it at lunch. I'll check it before I go to bed. So probably at least three. Mm, that's awesome, man. Do you, on your phone, do you have uh, notifications set up for for your social medias and your, and your email or no? The only notification on my phone are texts. See, that's a, that's a tip, man. That's a tip. That's I hate I that use. stuff. That's the thing I disabled first, and, yeah. it, and it was years and years ago. And anytime I, I, you know, have a new app or something, it's like I just don't want notifications. Right. Yeah, it creates that Pavlovian response. The <laughs> I get so mad. It's almost like you know you get mad whenever these robo calls happen or something. Yeah. It's like creating those yourself with those notifications. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what else, man? Uh, you, you see anything, you watch any cool shit? I know that here's something that, that popped up. I think maybe just, I just saw it today. Yeah. It was a discussion about Howard Chaikin's black kiss uh, and yeah. whether it qualifies as an outlaw comic. I'm a big Howard Chaikin comics fan. Um, 
American American flag is like a really important comic to me. You know, we talk about some of these Frank Miller comics and some of these different comics that have been important to us. American flag is a huge comic for me. Uh, the way he uses media, the way he uses typography, repetition. There's just a lot in that comic that that I think is still maybe ahead of ahead of its time. Um, whenever I turned 16, I would just look in like newspapers and yellow pages for anything comics related. And I found an ad in the newspaper, <laughs> in newspaper, how old am I? I found an ad for some guy selling comics like out of his house. This wasn't that uncommon. So I, I, you know, find a map or something to figure out where this place is at. And I show up there. I'm 16 years old, driving my mom's car to a bad section of town. And it's in this dude's house in like an attic kind of a, a area. In hindsight, I'm lucky he did not abduct me and kill me. But instead, <laughs> he showed me a couple of long boxes of comics and I went through them. He wasn't selling them as like a, the bulk. It was like, pick out some stuff if you want to buy it. And that's where I first encountered Howard Chaikin's Black Kiss. If anybody knows that comic, I mean, it's the perfect serial killer setting place for me to find this comic. And so in my mind, Black Kiss is definitely outlaw, partially because of the way I encountered it. But uh, <laughs> Sure, man. You know, I think visually it fits the outlaw, how we describe it as being very ink heavy. There's more black ink on that page than there is white negative space. He's bringing in screen tones and patterns and, and certainly, you know, NC-17 material there. So that's an outlaw comic to me. And also, I got that one early enough that it was influential. So uh, go Howard Chaikin. I'm glad you uh, I'm glad it all worked out for you, Jim. <laughs> Because if it would, if it wouldn't have, I would have had to be a victim blamer on our own live stream. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, uh, it was not my smartest move, but I, I guess I did get lucky there. American flag comics were some of my uh, earliest comics, too. Like going along with that Carnage comic from Eternity Comics, uh, when you're a young Catholic boy and you're in second grade and you have your your Holy Communion, there's a big there's a big party. And my, my aunt, she, she knew little Eddie liked comics and she just uh, gave me a giant box of comics that she got uh, from, it was a KB toy store. I could see the little tag ripped off that said KB toys. And it was like, you know, three for a dollar or something like that. And the, uh, at first I was, I, I held on to them forever. I still have them. Uh, most of them red, red to tatters, but, um, I was mad because I didn't think she loved me. Because they were all uh, like what I call generic comics. There was no Spider-Man in the bunch. Not There wasn't even one thing with a Marvel logo. It was like Whisper and uh, John Sable Freelance. And Grim oh, go Jack. easy on Whisper, man. <laughs> all that stuff. But uh, there were American flags in that mix. And these are post uh, Howard Chaikin ones. He would still do the cover. But I forget who did the, the writing. It might have been like... Uh, uh, well, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't remember. Um, but there was this one, you know, there's that little, that little cat that could talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, they're in this, they're in this pool and the cat is like licking this, like a paperweight. And they, there's just this like whole page about licking on a glass tit I, and how it's like one of the life's great joys. Now I got this when I was in second grade <laughs> And I brought that comic to school and it made me like the most popular dude in class, man, because we just all read that same panel over and over again because it said something about like licking a glass tit and how it's like one of the world's greatest pleasures. And me and the dudes are like, dude, it's going to be us when we're older, man. Like it's one of the great <laughs> pleasures. This is like what we have to look forward to when we become adults. Good thing wow. we didn't. Good thing we didn't see Black Kiss then. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, yes, <laughs> absolutely a good thing. That would damage a second grader. Got to tell Howard Chaikin that story, man, when we, when we had dinner with him last year. And then I also revealed to him that, uh, dude, I was a fan of yours so long ago that I thought that graphic novel was called Time Two, and he said uh, the difference between you and some other people are that they're freaking adults, and they, br and they bring it up to me. <laughs> And ask ask me to sign their copy of Time Two. <laughs> so, Jim, can you share what you're working on yet, or what, man? I can't, but uh, I, I am wrapping up my next spread, and 
I don't know how many pages I'm even on. I'm about 10 pages in. And I realized like these two pages are the best ones I've drawn so far this project, maybe so far in my life. Yeah. And one of my takeaways is it takes some time to ramp up into a new project. And I don't know why this is a new lesson for me, but it's, you know, it's a lot of like feeling out what you're doing in those first several pages as you kind of like build those muscles up for, you know, whatever the style is, whatever the characters are, the look of the book. And uh, I'm so thrilled. It feels like I've turned this corner of like, I've got it. Like, you know, it feels like I'm running and, you know, like I'm, I'm, at, I'm at pace now. And I've kind of worked out a lot of the decision making to get to this point. I, I feel like I have a grasp of the characters. The page layouts are really fun. So it's a good place to be. I wish I could share more details. Um, but man, it, it feels good. It feels nice to have a page on the drawing table that you look at and you're like, that's right. I want to do another one like that. <laughs> that always happens. Like, I don't think there's ever, there ever will be a time where you'll feel differently uh, when it comes to starting a new project. It's like, you're always finding your footing, you know, like that's just, that's just how it goes, man. Uh, and it takes a couple to get your, your sea legs or whatever. Um, even doing the X-Men thing and knowing that it's like, it's a big, it's a whole, you know, like it's a continuity doing each issue, like to start it off, it was that same process over and over again. Um, when you would work on street angel, would it be that same way? Like whenever it would be a new album, you, you, you were figuring things out. Yeah, each one would be a little different with the Street Angel books, you know, because they'd be different tools and stuff. Um, I saw John Weaver asked us, you know, to talk a little bit about drawing tech. And like with the Street Angel books, some were in ink, some were in pencil, some were all digital where I was drawing with an Apple pencil on an iPad. So there was definitely a curve for each one. Um, I've, you know, we've shared posts of like our, our page template templates and what we're working on. You know, switching sizes is one of those things that creates a big like bump and learning curve, uh, an adjustment, if you will. I think that's part of what I'm reacting to with the story I'm working on now is like I've, I've gotten used to the sizes. You know, you, you just think that way. So the Street Angels, each book was different and, and there was the same kind of like learning to learning to walk again or whatever for each one. And some of that was because there was time off between books and the writing process. You know, there was time at the end of each book of putting the books together. So it wasn't drawing every day. It was doing all sorts of other whatever design was necessary to put the book together. Um, you know, so there would be interruptions in just the daily drawing practice with those books. Um, so there's, you know, in my experience, everything I've done has been that way where like that first couple of weeks or first several pages is a lot of figuring out answering questions that once you come up with an answer you like, you don't have to go through again. But in the beginning of every project is that way, figuring out which tools you want, you know, like I ordered a bunch of different inks um, and, and actually started using a different ink yesterday on the page, uh, mostly because I'm running out of the stuff I had been using. I used to use Dr. Martin's tech ink, which I had bought so long ago that I did it over the phone. Like they didn't even have a website where I bought it from. And I bought maybe a gallon's worth in like pint bottles. <laughs> that stuff is just, it's tar pits at this point, the little bit that's left, you could probably cut out of the tube. Um, so, you know, like there, there's even like learning the new tools and things you wear down a pen or you start a new pen nib. And Ed, this is something you can talk about much better than I can, but like those hunt one Oh twos or those Meru pen nibs, when you put a new one in, man, they're like razor sharp. It takes, you know, it takes a little bit of drawing with them just to kind of, at least for me to get comfortable with them. It's, it's real interesting to see a different approach that uh, cartoonists take with, sp with certain tools like the 102 as well, because there are people who want those like super thin lines and they want that 102 to get it. So for them, a, a hunt 102 lasts maybe a half a page. Uh, and then they have to switch it out because then the lines are getting a little too bold for their taste. And, uh, you know, that's sort of that's sort of one of those things that we all got to figure out. I uh, I will tell you that I haven't yet um, used the Meru nib yet because <laughs> because my uh, my 102 is holding steady, but I think I'm going to have to have to use it soon. It's going to be the very next nib I put in the holder, man. But I uh, once we're once we're done here and we wrap this up, I'm going to finish uh, page 21, 21 of uh, of issue one or part one of uh, Red Room. 
And uh, I've got to thank everybody who comes to the stream to kind of keep me company while I while I put that together. I, uh, dude, I, I basically have constructed almost every page live on on our, our YouTube streams, man. Which just feels wild. I don't know that 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 happens. You know what I mean? I don't know who else. It's really cool. Is is doing that shit? I did draw uh, completely ink page twenty uh, without streaming. And the reason for that was I wanted to see if the stream was cutting into my productivity. I wanted to see if that was wasting my time when I was inking. Am I too self-conscious? I don't feel like I am. And I came away with, uh, no, it's just like, I'm, I'm, my, my speed is my speed. Uh, I'm not going to be a hack. I'm not a fucking jobber. So it's going to, you know, take however long it takes. And uh, I was able to resume the streams up again, man. But page 21, it's like I have a, a 11 pages to go before finishing this part. I'm stoked to sit with it all at once and read it as a unit and then address everything that I need to like for part two. You know what I mean? Like get every, get all my ducks in a row, re-letter some things, uh, you know, change some of the dialogue and stuff, and then objectively look at that part. And just ask myself, like, and then what happens? You know what I mean? Like, like, where do we go from here? What do we need to know about the characters? Uh, one other great thing about reading Preacher after absorbing all of these lessons from our writing class to the Mamet, Aaron Sorkin, Neil Gaiman gimmicks, man, the, the Alan Moore pieces, uh, Stephen King on writing. Now that I have conscious incompetence and know what I do not know upon rereading preacher. I can be a little bit more analytical when it comes to the writing part and I can identify the various ways that Garth Ennis is able to take a character who isn't super important to the greater whole, uh, but in a few panels, we know what this character wants and needs and what their point is. Uh, that's a valuable lesson. You know, that's a very valuable lesson that I'm absorbing for myself. Uh, it's a, it's, it's crucial. Um, go pick up a comic off the fucking rack and see, and see if, uh, see if any of those comics and writers abide by that. Uh, I'll leave it at that, man. Um, that's a really good, that's, that's a, Really good point, Ed, um, from the writing standpoint. I'm actually, well, I had two two things I wanted to add. One is on the pen nibs wearing down, just because whenever you mention people swapping out pen nibs, you know, maybe one a page or half a page to keep that sharp line. I always remember I got hold of the hardcover collection of Mobius's Silver Surfer, I, you know, when I was a little kid, kind of accidentally. And there's uh, an inner, an afterword or something. There might be an interview with Mobius talking about his craft and his tools. And he talks about how he likes when the pen nibs would wear down, would break in. I think he described it. And the lines would get thicker and heavier. And it just always stuck with me. But in terms of the of this writing, what you're describing, they're, they're, I'm doing an interview right now with Cecil uh, Castellucci, the the writer, co-creator of Plain Janes, it's, you know, Plain Janes promotion, and we're interviewing each other for this outlet. And so we're talking a little bit about craft, you know, and Plain Janes was the first comic book she had written, but she had written several books in prose before that. And so like what you're describing, you know, in terms of, of craft and economy and character motivation, these are things that like, you you could hear you could hear a filmmaker right describe this in a master class or in an interview or whatever like their craft and they apply to almost any kind of storytelling especially storytelling with say a three act structure and characters character motivation there's so much of that is absent from the comics and so like in this interview i was asking her about that you know kind of the craft of writing for prose and then writing for comics and differences and she talked about how economical the writing for comics has to be um, you know, a page of prose might be several pages of comics, so you have to be very clear. And it's exactly what you're describing with Garth Ennis's ability to have, you know, a, a, a very small character show up, but instantly establish why that character's there, what their interest is. Um, you know, it's that old thing of like everybody's the star in their own play or whatever that expression is. Right. Like even if it's a throwaway character, 
they have some motive. They want something, you know, if it's a character that is like a real character, um, they're there for a reason. What are they there for? Being able to get that across quickly, you're right. Like, that's not something you see in a lot of comics. And when you were saying it, I wondered, is that, you know, is that a result of the Marvel method, right? Where like somebody's just trying to make sense of the words after they get this art back and it's, you know, the plot's kind of crazy and hard to follow and, and in pieces. I don't know. I don't know what the reason for that is, but it does seem like we don't have we don't have that formal quality the way certain other media does. And it could be, you know, it could be paycheck related. It could be the amount of money. If you're making a, a, a several million dollar budget film or television show, maybe you have greater attention to that kind of detail. I don't know. The comics definitely don't have a lot of examples of it. <laughs> No, and, and and which makes it uh, almost glaring when you read Preacher, because it's it's just it's super clear. And I see we have uh, our man of the hour, Ben Ben Mera, in the chat. He said he he read all the Preachers, uh, not too long ago, a couple years back. And when we got off the stream, we were talking about like we need Ben back ASAP. Do some kind of book book club gimmick or whatever. Uh, would Preacher be that? I'm just going to put that out there, man, because maybe that would work. But we had some other ideas. <laughs> it's true. You know, uh, I hate to do this with Ben present because I feel kind of weird saying it, but he's a guy that I think writes good dialogue. Yeah. And it's something I've talked to him about, kind of his approach to that as well. And, and you know, we talk about it a little bit on our on our live stream with him from the other night. But it, it does stand out. Like you said, Ed, when you find somebody that does this stuff well, it, it does stand out in comics. Preacher did have uh, a good letters column. Somebody in the chat just said, and, and by the way, uh, Ben Mara says it's a good idea to do Preacher, man. So, uh, so uh, that we might have that settled um, for, <laughs> for what we, we end up talking about on, on our next stream or, or whatever. But uh, Preacher did have a really good uh, letters column. And I think it speaks to uh, the creators, like doing everything they can to make their books a success. And the reason why the letters column was good was because it was kind of like the McFarlane approach. Like Garth Ennis vetted the letters, responded to the letters, uh, built contests every week. I mean, excuse me, every month into uh, and just wove that into the fabric. They created a small subculture within the letters column that I think uh, was valuable. It's certainly at a time before the Internet and social media and all that sort of thing, man. But um Using using the kayfabe channel uh, yesterday, I guess it was, man, like I put together that video um, because we did like a one day kind of flash sale for the signed a numbered edition of uh, of the uh, the studio edition. And, and that went over real big. And it may actually made me think about how uh, what we're doing here is basically what we would have been doing if we had letters, columns and letters, pages in comics say 25 years ago like if we if we were brought up in the serialized comic universe that we are kind of really not a part of you know we're in a graphic novel universe um one of the keys to success is is building community uh you and all those grant morrison did it uh all the top dogs did it man so very thankful to to have you jim put this channel together, have our friends kind of like bolster the thing. And we even Ben Mara into some future eps. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think that shit was, it, I mean, it's just going to be fun. It's just yeah. going to be real fun. And I think that fun will, will resonate to the, uh, to the audience, man. I agree, Ed. And, uh, that may be a good place to wrap up for tonight. Um, cause I don't think I can improve on that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man. So uh, we will get the heck out of here. Uh, we have lots of recording to do. I think this next Sunday stream, uh, not stream, but the next uh, Sunday video that we're going to put up, we're going to put up like a two and a half hour video from rating Warren Bernard's esteemed collection, man. Uh, looking at works from some of them are 100 years old. Crazy. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. And I know he told us a Garth Ennis story. I can't remember if it was if it makes the final cut or if it was even on video or if it was during lunch. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there may be more more Garth Ennis talk on that one, possibly. Yeah, that is true. I forgot. Yeah, like that's a thing. Like Warren would 
like people stay at his house, you know, like Garth Ennis stayed at his place because he's a big mark for World War II stuff. And Warren has so much of that, all kinds of cartooning that comes from that space, man. Anyhow, man, we could go on for hours. We should yes. wrap it up. Uh, I think uh, I think I hit all of my notes, man. So, Jimmy, if you want to give them the, those marching orders, I'll fucking end this stream, dude. I think you guys know what to do. Read more comics. Read more comics. 